Now, Bibles, please. Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Brother John McBride brought a good Sunday school class on Hebrews 6. I was going to say I was going to preach from there and fix everything he said wrong this morning, but <laughs> I wouldn't have anything to preach on. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 2. And uh, let's see, we still have the uh, angel tree out in the uh, vestibule for those who are uh, wanting to be involved with that. There are 10 angels left there on the tree. And uh, so that's great. I think we had 61 at the beginning. And we've got good involvement, have 10 left. So if you'd like to pick up an extra one or haven't yet picked one up, please do that. We're still looking at December the 9th to have the gifts back, okay? And then someone who got a gift for Eliza, Eliza, A-L-I-Z-Y-A, -A, uh, please see Maybell, all right, uh, and uh, some information there regarding that. But anyway, we appreciate your involvement there with the uh, angel tree. Hebrews chapter number 2, and we'll begin reading here in verse number one, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his will. And uh, verse 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. Let's pray together, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Lord, we do thank you for salvation. We're grateful for the gathering of the saints, for the church, Lord, for the Bible, for the presence of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that you'll help us now as we come to this time in your word. Uh, Father, help our hearts and minds be open to the work of the Spirit of God. Challenge us, Lord, we pray. Grow us. Lord, use us is our prayer this morning. And uh, help us to realize the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and his gift of salvation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Of course, uh, it's superfluous for me to tell you that this is the giving season. This is the time uh, of gift giving uh, here in our country and in, in many others. Uh, since Black Friday, shoppers have been running to and fro trying to find the perfect gift. And uh, that has resulted in the fact that the stores and the traffic are going to be a madhouse probably right on through Christmas Eve, late Christmas Eve most likely. Uh, and uh, they'll continue to be that way. To say that Christmas has lost its original meaning and intent is an understatement. Uh, and this has been despite the reminders of some, of course, we recently went to uh, see uh, our daughter in Florida and, uh, and uh, Haley and Dylan and, and to see them and uh, hadn't been in Pensacola, their area, in a long time uh, since, the, since we were in the military there. Uh, but I saw some interesting things uh, down there. Uh, one church we uh, saw on their marquee, on their sign, Jesus is the reason for the season. And that was big and that was bold and... Uh, uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's a statement that has become so cliche, it's lost its meaning. Everybody says it, uh, and uh, we just wonder how many really mean it. And so, uh, another church we saw, I think it's the first church I've ever seen, they had their church building uh, with lights on the outside of it, like we do our homes. I, I don't know that I've ever seen that before. But uh, they had the white light icicles around and then right on their shingled roof in big red letters, it took up the whole roof, it said Jesus. Jesus. And that was meant, of course, to uh, remind the busy shoppers, of course, as they went back and forth about what Christmas is supposed to be. Uh, it, it is the giving season, but uh, you and I know that, uh, as Pastor mentioned a few moments ago, that the founding and the greatest gift has been forgotten, pretty much, in our society. 
And for those of us who have a conscientious grasp of the origins of this season, 2 Corinthians 9 and 15 almost always come to mind. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. And that is, of course, the gift of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and the free gift of salvation that is provided through His death, burial, and resurrection. If there ever was a gift that keeps giving, it is Jesus Christ and salvation. Amen. That is God's, uh, God's greatest gift to men. That is the gift that is spoken of here in Hebrews chapter number 2, when it, in verse 3, when it talks about so great salvation. Salvation is the greatest thing in all the world. Amen. An individual can possess every possible advantage in this life. But if they die unsaved without Christ, none of that will have mattered. Because in, in eternity, uh, when we see what goes on there, earthly position doesn't matter there. You remember the Bible talks about in Luke chapter number 16, a, a, a rich man that wore purple, uh, most likely a reference to his position, his authority maybe, uh, maybe a governmental individual, but, in, but the Bible says he ended up in hell. Earthly possessions won't matter there. Uh, and uh, uh, earthly position won't matter there. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, that one of these days... Um, uh, the, all that we see, the works, the Bible says, of the earth are going to be burned up, right. gone. Uh, and you think about some of the things we get enamored with and some of the things that some of, the, some, some of us have. You, know, you worn ourselves out trying to find in a store somewhere, will one day just be a puff of smoke. And uh, the Lord said in Matthew 6 and verse 26, for what is man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Of course, Paul reminds us we brought nothing in this world, certain we can carry nothing out. And so a person who lives life and does not get saved, does not uh, have a relationship, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, has wasted this life and has missed God's plan for them in this life. The Bible's clear from uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 that God is one, the Bible says, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's what God's desire is for every individual. Again, 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but His long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm thankful for that message. Amen. Somewhere in that word all was me. Somewhere in that word all is you. <laughs> and so I'm thankful that he is willing that all should come to repentance. And so considering the greatness of salvation and the fact that God is willing that everyone should possess it, it's a shame that so many reject it's a shame that so many neglect this greatest gift until it's too late. And the Bible tells us here uh, in our text in Hebrews chapter number 2, the greatness of salvation. It, it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? What makes salvation so great? There are several things we uh, can mention this morning. Salvation is great because of what it includes. Now... I got saved at 19 years old, and I've shared uh, our testimony with you there before. I was saved out of a drunkard's life, uh, and a, a terrible, wicked life, uh, and ended up uh, coming to church at the invitation of a friend of mine, uh, and uh, after some trouble in my life, and uh, I remember walking forward in the service that morning and asking Jesus Christ to forgive me. But about, but about all I knew at that point as a new believer is that according to the Bible, I would go to heaven and not have to go to hell. Now, that's not a bad thing to know, amen. But it certainly is not all that there is to it. Salvation includes several things, and that's what makes it great. It includes the deliverance from sin's reign in our life. 
Romans 5 and 21 uh, speaks of that when it says that sin hath reigned unto death. Until someone receives Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they are under the reign of sin. No unbeliever is a master of their own destiny. They are under the reign of sin until they are set free by Jesus Christ. Amen. And the Bible's clear on that matter. And the, one of the things, again, that makes salvation great is that it includes this deliverance from sin's reign. Again, speaking of the unsaved, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 26 says that we do what we do that they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You know, I remember being unsaved and, and thinking that my life was mine and I, you know what? How my life came out was up to me. But in the end, you begin to realize, wait a minute, I'm not free. I'm bound by chains of sin. I'm bound to my own will and my own way, which uh, if I allow to happen without coming to Christ will end in death. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so we were born in sin. Now that's not popular, is it? But it's true. Psalm 51 and 5 says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. Well, how long have you been a sinner? Ever since you were born. That's what the Bible said. We were shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We were born with a sin nature. Romans 5 and verse 12 says, So death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. And we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Before a, before a person is saved, they can no more stop sinning than a dog can stop barking. Because that's what a dog does. It barks. I remember in Japan years ago, we had a lady, she had bought, a, I think it was a schnauzer. I can't even say it right. Every time I think of it, I want to say schnitzel, but I don't know. Uh, she had, and she started to get in trouble with the neighbors. It was one of those yappy dogs. Just yapped all the time. And there she was on the military base. And the neighbors kept calling the housing authority and all that. You got to do something with these folks next door. Their dog's driving us nuts. And they couldn't very well move. So I, you may agree with it or not. I don't know. But she took the dog to the vet and had its vocal cords removed. I'd never known of that before. But it didn't stop that dog from barking. You just couldn't hear him. <laughs> he, I mean, I was there at the house. We visited with him regularly. And uh, there something would happen outside. And boy, that dog would go right to the back glass and just... That's what it was right there. <laughs> you couldn't hear a thing. And I never could remember the dog's name till after that. And uh, I would always ask him, how's Whisper this morning? <laughs> but whether that dog had a voice or not, its nature was to bark. And uh, you and I, born in sin, we have a, a, a nature to sin. That's what we do, and there's no hope outside of Jesus Christ for help there. Before salvation, one is a slave to that nature. Uh, Peter told Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8 and, thir uh, 8 and verse 23, he said, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon the sorcerer had been following Peter and the, uh, and the folks along with them for some period of time. A and then he saw the power of God and he, uh, and he said uh, uh, on, the, on, on Peter and his group, and he said, I want to give you money uh, that I can have that same power. And in that statement, Peter began to realize, hey, wait a minute here. I'm not sure this guy understands what's going on. And he said, I think you're still in the bond of iniquity. The bond of iniquity. And so before salvation, we're all slaves to sin. Ephesians 2 and 3 says, Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, born in sin, born with no hope. But at salvation, God liberates us. He delivers us from sin's reign. He gives us liberty so that we no longer have to choose sin. In John 8 and 36, the Bible says, If the Son therefore make you free, ye shall be free indeed. 
Now the Spirit, of, now, the, uh, now the Lord is that Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, 17, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. In Romans 6 and verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Isn't that a wonderful thought? For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Look, look in your Bible with me quickly at Luke chapter number 4. I, I'd like for you to read this part uh, with me, if you can. You have your Bible, Luke chapter number 4. And here in this chapter, we see the Lord's first public spoken words. Uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the temple, in the synagogue, rather, Luke 4, 4, 4, and verse number 18. Well, let's look at verse 17. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written therein. Look, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. Look, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Now, if you need a life purpose statement, that's a good one. That's what Jesus lived to do. We do far worse living with that same motive in our life as well. God help me to be used of you there to preach the gospel to, uh, to uh, the, the poor, to uh, heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Oh, that we would keep that as our focus and drive of life. But only through Jesus Christ and that by faith can we, can we have freedom from the binding power of sin. And so salvation is great because it includes uh, deliverance from sin's reign. But salvation is also great because it provides peace with God. Look in your Bible at Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter number 5. <coughs> and uh, here in... Uh, the first verse, Romans chapter 5, and beginning here in verse 1. The Bible says, Therefore being justified by faith. Salvation's by faith. We'll talk about that in a minute. Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that word peace there means to reconcile two who have been enemies. And the word peace in chapter 5 there in verse 1 doesn't mean necessarily that you change your feelings, although that will happen. It means that God changes His feeling towards you. At the moment that you receive Christ as your Savior, uh, you uh, are given peace from God and He no longer sees you as an enemy. Before salvation, man without doubt is God's enemy. Right here in Romans chapter 5 and look over at verse number 10. <clears throat> Romans 5 and 10. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So that word, if there again, has the idea of since. And so he says here, since when we were enemies. The idea is this. Everyone that is not yet saved is an enemy of God. Is an enemy of God. And he says in James 4 and 4 is proof of that. Ye adulterers and adulterers, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Now after you're saved, you have a choice whether to love God or whether to love the world. But the unsaved individual just loves the world and the things of the world. That's all they know. That's what we read in Ephesians chapter number 2. And so according to James 4 and 4, that makes uh, them and made us before we were saved uh, enemies of God. Matthew 12 and 30 says, He that is not with me is against me. That's what Jesus said. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You see, in God's mind, there is no neutral ground. You and I this morning are either saved or lost. You're either a friend, uh, you're either a friend or an enemy. Uh, there are only two positions for him or against him. There can be no riding the fence. 
Some would say, well, I'm not anti-religion or anti-church, but we're not talking about religion and church. We're talking about Jesus Christ. It's not what you think about religion or church. It's what you think about Jesus. And so you must answer in your heart the same question uh, that Pilate asked in Matthew 27, 22. What shall I do with Jesus which is called the Christ? You must decide what you believe about his statement in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You and only you can answer that question. And of course, if we don't believe that He is the Son of God, if we don't believe on Him for salvation, uh, we are against God and His Son according to the Bible. So this idea, and we find it more and more as our society becomes uh, religious. Everybody wants to take a neutral position, but you cannot be neutral with Christ. You either have Him or you don't. You either know Him or you don't. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either for Him and gathering with Him according to Him, or you're scattering abroad and you are against Him. And so before salvation, clearly we are God's enemy. But after salvation, there is peace with God. And that's an amazing truth because most people live their lives, all of their life, seeking for peace. And you know as well as I do, there can be external peace and internal warfare. I'm talking about in your heart, in your mind. People are looking for peace and they try everything in the world. You know, addictions and all of that. Uh, but the moment you place your faith in Christ, the Bible says you have peace with God. Jesus said in John 15, 14, Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. And His commandment for the sinner is to believe on me. Uh, Brother John's Sunday school lesson sparked a thought in my mind about uh, the individual that came to Jesus and said, what, uh, what, what work of God do I need to do, you know, basically to be in the kingdom, to be saved? And Jesus' response is, this is the work of God that ye believe. Amen. That's it. He didn't give a list. He didn't say, you know, go to church and tithe and be baptized and pray and all that other kind of thing. He said, God's work, the only work, if you want to call it a work, and that's what his intention was there, you know, air quotes, the only work that you can do and be saved is believe. Believe or not. Salvation is great because it includes deliverance from sin's reign. Salvation is great because it, it gives us peace with God. And then salvation is great because of the deliverance from the penalty of sin. And this is the main thing. You know why we need salvation? Not because there's a heaven, but because we're sinners. That's it. The main thing with regard to salvation is that we have our sin forgiven. Heaven is a byproduct Sin is the main problem. The Bible says that sin has a penalty in Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Ezekiel 18 and 4, Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Right here in Romans chapter number 5 and verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. This this penalty of death is required as payment for sin. And death is e ultimately is eternal separation from God in hell. Now, look in your Bible with me at Revelation. Revelation 20. Revelation 20. And, of course, Revelation is the book about the end times. <clears throat> it's not the only book about the end time. Uh, but it's the one people think about. Uh, when they think about, you know, prophecy and all that kind of thing. And in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 11, we see the final judgment there of all the unsaved. Revelation 20 and verse 11, 
The Bible says, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open, which is the book of life. Uh, excuse me, another book is open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Uh, you know, the amazing thing is people say, well, I, I, I don't necessarily, you know, if I, if I believe that salvation is by faith, that's too easy. So I'm just going to do what I need to do. And so God says, fine. And in time you'll be judged by what you did all of they're going to be judged according to their works verse 12 verse 13 and what happens the sea gave up the dead which were in it death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death the first death of course is that which is physical your body dies. The second death is to be judged by God. Uh, verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the penalty for sin. Death. And we cannot avoid it on our own. We owe a penalty if we're unsaved and God does not sacrifice His justice on the altar of His love. If an individual goes on without salvation, without trusting Christ, then they pay the penalty they owe, which is to go into hell and stay there forever and ever and ever, constantly paying but never getting it paid. That's why John 3 and 36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth. That's continual. The wrath of God abideth on him. A man, woman, boy, or girl dies and goes into hell. Ten million years from now, the wrath of God will still be abiding. A billion years and the wrath of God will still be abiding. The soul that dies without Christ will suffer the torments of hell for eternity. Because sin has a penalty eternal separation from God in hell and that penalty must be paid so in love Jesus Christ paid the penalty for sin and he did it for several reasons he did it for one reason to, to identify with us he came to earth to identify with us Hebrews 2 tells us he was a partaker of flesh and blood so he came to live for us so that he could die for us. He identified with us. He lived for us. The Bible says, was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. He lived a life that you and I could not live to pay the debt that we must pay if he hadn't. He came to die for us. The Bible says that God on the cross of Calvary put all our sin upon him. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. He died in our place to pay the penalty that we owe. Even, He said, as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Amen. Amen. And so He died for us. He identified with us. He lived for us. He died for us to deliver us. When we trust Christ as Savior, the sentence is lifted and we're saved from the penalty of sin. John 3, 18. Again, he that believeth on him is not condemned. Romans chapter number 8. If you look over here to Romans 8 and verse 1, tremendous first statement of Romans 8 and 1. Therefore is there, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah and amen. It doesn't say there's in no condemnation to those that have, uh, you know, on the church roll, to those that have been baptized, to those that sing in the choir, to those that give offerings, to those that say their prayers every night. That's not mentioned there. Condemnation is removed uh, when we choose to be in Christ by faith and faith alone. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 33, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. 
And so salvation's great because of the deliverance from sin's reign, because of peace with God, because of deliverance from the penalty of sin. And then salvation is great because of its provision of our own spiritual attorney. Have you ever had to retain an, a, an attorney? Uh, we have in time past. It's no small price, is it? Just to retain one costs quite a bit of money. And sometimes if you're unable to retain one, you end up in trouble. Legally. That's the case it is with salvation. We're in trouble. We're guilty. We're all criminals. And if we don't get a good lawyer, we're in a mess before the, throne, uh, the judging throne of God. But the Bible tells us in 1 John 2 and 1, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that word advocate means attorney, counselor, one that pleads our case. Salvation is also great though because it includes the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Because your sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The blessed Spirit of God is a part of the gift of salvation. And the day we place our faith in Christ, God gives us the Holy Spirit to abide in us forever. That's what He promised in John 14, 16. I will pray the Father. He will give you another comforter that He may abide with you forever. Amen. Amen. Sometimes those who teach salvation by grace through faith are accused of giving people license to sin. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, if I believed you could just believe and be saved, you know, some kind of deathbed confession, then I'd live like the devil until I knew I was going to die, and then I'd believe on Jesus. I've heard that. The problem is, you don't know when you're going to die. <laughs> There's not always preparation. A letter in the mail doesn't come. Email, text, whatever. A post on social media. You know, your number's up. That's <laughs> So you better get right with God now. Amen. The Bible says we don't know what tomorrow may hold. Uh, some people say, well, if I believe in salvation by grace through faith, cause people to go out and live like the devil. We would completely disagree. Amen. Think about it. A very simple illustration. What's a, what's a better deterrent to speeding? The sign or the policeman sitting there with a the radar gun? You know what I'm talking about because some of y'all just came back from Thanksgiving. You didn't slow down until you saw a car sitting in the median. Did you? <laughs> right. Right. The Holy Spirit is like that policeman with the radar. See? That deters us from sin. And so when we get saved, the Spirit comes to permanently indwell us. And uh, uh, Brother McBride mentioned this morning in Sunday school uh, in, from Ephesians 1 and 13, the Bible says, In whom uh, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest of our inheritance, the redemption of the purchased possession of the praise of His glory. And so His presence in your life will cause you to live more like Christ than a thousand rules and regulations. Right. Salvation is great because of what it includes. That's quite a list. It's like, salvation is like one of those uh, uh, presents that, uh, that you open and you open the big box and then there's a little and there's something and something and something. And it just keeps on coming up. But salvation is also great because of who it includes. I think we've all realized by this time that everyone cannot have everything. Not everyone can have a good education. They're trying, right? We work at it, but not everyone can. Not everyone can have a million dollars. We've all figured that out, right? Most, yeah, most of us. Not everyone can have good health. But everyone can be saved. Salvation is great because of who it includes. 
Revelation 22, 17, The Spirit of the bride say, Come, let him that hears say, Come, let him that is thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. 1 John 2 and 2, He is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. There is not a sinner that ever lived that Jesus did not die for. There's not a sinner alive who cannot be saved if they'll come to Christ. Salvation is for all men. The Bible's clear that Jesus was sent to provide the great gift of salvation to the world. And so it's great because of who it includes. You know what? You can never give it to the wrong person. Never hand out the gospel tract to the wrong person. Never talk to the wrong person because salvation's for all men. Amen. The whole world can be saved if they will. That's what God wants for them. But salvation is great also then because of how it concludes. How it includes. Someone said simplicity is truth's most becoming garment. I'm glad, aren't you, that truth that, uh, that salvation is simple? Two, two, two prereq prerequisites we find for salvation. And some have called them two sides of the same coin. The first is repentance. Repentance. Why did we need a Savior? We said a little bit ago. Why? Because we're sinners. And we don't need help until we admit we're sinners. And therefore have a desire to repent. Look in your Bible with me at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And uh, I think in an effort to help the world to know that God loves them. Many in the evangelical movement have tried to take away the negative aspect of the pre-salvation work of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter number 20, and uh, in verse number uh, 21. Well, let's go to verse 20. Paul said, Acts 20 and verse 20, Paul said, And, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Look, here it is. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look over in Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter number 6. Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. And again, Brother McBride did a great job explaining how that God is talking to us here about growing. You can't live like a Christian babe all the time. There's more to salvation than just missing hell. The idea, you know, we understand that. we got to understand that. Grow into it. Appreciate it. Let it motivate us to tell others they need to be saved. Amen. But he says here, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation. What's the foundation? Here it is. Repentance from dead works and faith toward God. That's it. You see it twice. Hebrews, Hebrews uh, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter 20 and verse 21, and then Hebrews 6 and 1. We find in Hebrews 6 and 1 that the idea of preaching repentance and faith is foundational to the gospel. Before there can ever be saving faith, there must be full awareness of sin. Otherwise, there's no reason to believe for salvation. And so, we are living uh, in, in, in a time when there, and as always has been, but especially now, there needs to be a, a genuine sorrow for our sin, not just its consequences. 
So what happens when we preach the gospel and we say the consequences of sin is hell? Is it? Yes, it is. But if it's all we preach, then what do people do? They pray to miss hell more than praying to have sins forgiven. See? It becomes a consequence faith. And the Bible's clear that when we preach, we're to preach repentance. Repentance from what? Well, if you look in Exodus chapter number 20, you find a whole list of God's law there. And He warns us not to love things more than God. Every one of us has done that. He warns us not to worship other things. Every one of us has done that. Yeah, you say, well, I've not worshipped anybody. Well, you've worshipped self. He warns us not to blaspheme His name. He warns us not to dishonor parents. That about takes care of it, doesn't it? Every one of us have. He warns us about murder in Exodus 20 and 13. Thou shalt not kill. And somebody said, well, I've never killed anybody. But the Bible says if you hate your brother without a cause. When Jesus is interpreting all of that over in Matthew chapter 5, He talks about uh, thou shalt not commit adultery in Exodus 20 and verse 14. And the, and the Lord interpreted that saying, You've heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Jesus said, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He warns us about thievery. You know, thou shalt not steal. And so Malachi says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Tithes and offerings. Romans 13, 7 says, Render therefore unto all their dues, tribute to whom tribute, honor to whom custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And if we don't do those things, we've robbed, we've stolen. He warns us against lying in Exodus 20 and verse 6. He warns us against coveting in Exodus 20 and verse number 17. And the end result is we begin to realize that every one of us has broken the law of God. And then, <laughs> look over at James 2. We'll give you this and we'll bring her to a close. James 2. We have this, this problem because of our sin nature that we, we, just, we want to compare ourselves among ourselves and to say, well, you know, I'm better than some and all that other kind of thing. James chapter number 2 and verse 10. Look what he said here. James 2 and 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law. Has anybody done that? So for whosoever shall keep the whole law, look, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of just one. Oh, wait. He is guilty of all. So uh, the law is, uh, God said, as Pastor mentioned a couple weeks ago, it is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Because we realize as we look at God's law and what perfection is, in some shape, form, or fashion, I have broken God's law. So the first point of salvation is not, uh, of someone getting saved, is not I want to get to heaven. I do. But my first need of Christ is because I've sinned. And I've broken God's law. And I've broken God's heart. It's tough to find people moved by that much anymore. Because we've so normalized sin in our society. But the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and we've got to admit to it because the Bible goes on to say in 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. There must be an admittance of our sin and sorrow for how sorry we are and sickened and burdened enough by it to repent from it. I know, uh, and again, I, I, I didn't get saved when you got saved. I got saved when I got saved. Amen? That's deep, isn't it? But anyway, <laughs> I know one thing. At the, the day that I walked out to get saved, my life to me was so black, full of wickedness and waywardness. And in that service that morning, 
began to realize, you know what? The only help for me is Jesus. Amen. And I don't, somebody say, what would you pray? I don't remember what I prayed. Uh, but I know this. I remember you know, studying about the, the salvation, all it includes. I remember coming across the verse where Jesus was talking about the publican and the sinner. And he talked about the publican praying, Father, I thank thee that I'm not like these other men. Sorry, dogs, basically. And then he talked about that publican. Said, God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. Amen. Jesus said, that one walked away justified. Amen. And that's all I needed. Amen. An awareness of sin so that we fall at the feet of Jesus in faith for mercy. And the Bible's clear that Jesus said it twice, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. God always uses perish in reference to the unsaved. Except ye repent. That is a heart sickness for sin. You know, here's the thing. We don't hear a lot anymore of people wrestling with their sin in the days prior to their coming to Christ. We don't hear that much anymore because... And I think the church's desire is for people to be saved, for people to realize that God loves everybody. But if we try to bypass sin to just get to the good part, we mess the message up. And so we have people walking out of some of these services now where they said, oh, I had a great experience with God. I watched them over the weekend. No mention of repentance. No mention of faith. I know now that God loves me. Yes, but did you repent before Him? It's a frightening thing, really, because the end result of this is that you end up with an unregenerate church. People who in, in word profess Him, but in works deny Him. Repentance and faith. We read it there in, in uh, the book of Acts. Paul said in... Uh, in Acts 20 and verse 21, that he testified to the Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You can't be good enough, but he was perfect for you. And so it is a matter of trusting what he did for you the Bible says then that when we do that, His righteousness becomes ours. Why? Because God's good. That's why. You heard the story of uh, Charles Blondin. He was a, I think he was a Frenchman. He was a tightrope walker. And he would string a tightrope across Niagara Falls. 11,000 feet long it was, I understand, 160 feet off the water. And Charles Blondine would cross that tightrope. He'd walk across there. And uh, I was reading about it. He went across there on a bicycle. Can you imagine that? Generation X had nothing on Charles Blondine. <laughs> he went across there on stilts. Uh, they say he went across there one time with somebody on his back. I saw a picture of it. Uh, I hope it was another tightrope walker. Amen. And he pushed a wheelbarrow across there. One story says he stopped in the middle and cooked an omelet and had breakfast and went on to the other side. What about that? On one occasion, he pushed a wheelbarrow and he came back to the other side and he said to the crowd, how many of you believe that I could put somebody in this wheelbarrow and push him across this tightrope. Boy, and they say the crowd roared. Yeah, let's watch somebody else die. You know, that's what it means when they're roaring. <laughs> yeah, and then he said this, can I have a volunteer? <laughs> Crickets. <laughs> Crickets. Silence. <laughs> For a long time. And finally one. Raise his hand. You know, that's a picture of salvation. There's a lot of people that see Jesus like, like Charles Blondine. You know, they say, 
Well, I'm, I, I believe he can do it, but I'm not trusting him. Out of all of that crowd, one man. It reminds me of what Jesus said when he said, you know, uh, that the, 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 the path is narrow and few there be that find it. Broad is the gate to destruction. Yeah. Salvation is about who we're trusting and what we're trusting Him for. See, if life is that river, I'm not swimming across there and making it. I forgot how many millions of gallons go over Niagara Falls like what, every second or whatever. But you couldn't swim across there and make it. But that's what some people are trying to do with their life. If that was the only way across there, you, knew, you know who you'd have to trust to get there? Charles Blondine. He'll get you there. I'm telling you, the gulf into eternity is too fast, too swift, too strong for us to do it on our own. Amen. The only way we're going to pass safely to the other side into heaven is to trust Jesus Christ. Amen. Who came as God's greatest gift so that salvation could be a gift. Are you sure you've received it? Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer. And we'll provide an opportunity this morning for you, if you're with us and not sure that you're saved, to place your faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Once and for all, settle the issue with God. Maybe there's questions about your salvation. Not sure you're saved. Maybe this morning uh, you, you're wrestling with it. I mean, you, it, it's, it's, maybe you've prayed a prayer. Maybe you've done some things and you're still not in your soul. You're not settled. Would you let us help you? Because the Lord wants you to be settled. These things are written unto you to believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. God wants you to know. And we can help show you from His Word, not our Word, His. So you can have confidence, for God cannot lie. And so after we pray this morning, if that's you, uh, and you're not sure you're saved, you could step right out from where you are. As folks are standing, their heads and eyes, uh, heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You could step out and come down to the front. We'll have somebody take you aside, private place, show you from the Bible how to be saved. How to be saved, how to settle it. Or maybe, maybe, you just want to talk to us at some point after the service and say, I need to settle this thing. Maybe you came with somebody today and you said, well, I need to, can you help me talk to somebody? Whatever it may be. Man, settle your salvation. Make that the gift you received for Christmas. Father, thank you for your goodness.